Thank you, ladies. And I don't want to have a Bible study more than a sermon. Uh, you know, one of the good things about uh, that's come out of this um, coronavirus is that, of course, a lot a lot of churches now are on Facebook Live and and uh, YouTube and other things. This afternoon, as I was uh, sitting there with TV was going, but I was going through and seeing uh, several uh, church services. Uh, I watched a, a couple of people that I that I know uh, real well uh, that had their that's now on Facebook Live ever uh, ever Sunday, and uh, so it was a blessing to hear some some preaching. What I found out was uh, I am extremely old-fashioned. Uh, nobody is. Not only they're not wearing a coat, they're not wearing a tie. They're not wearing a tie. They're not wearing a coat. You know, just up there. Uh, but they're still preaching and preaching the word. And we pre- uh, appreciate uh, appreciate that. And so uh, it gives you something to uh, to uh, to do while while the TV's going. But there's nothing on there much worth watching. And so uh, you can hear some uh, some good preaching. So I put my earplugs in and uh, and hear some good things uh, on the on the internet there. All right, uh, the first verses that we're going to use is 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 5. It's really not my text verse. Uh, we're, we're, we're using, uh, today we're going to talk about God's news behind the news. You know, we need to realize that uh, everything is still in God's control. And uh, God knows exactly what's going on. And uh, in fact, we've been told uh, several times times throughout the scripture, several things that's going to be going on in, in the last days. Uh, number one, we know that there's going to be increasing moral breakdown and religious apostasy requiring Christians to be more alert and, uh, and dedicated. Second uh, Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, the Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, as long as I... Uh, as long as I've been preaching, we've said, well, this is the last days. But we must be in the last days or getting mighty close to the last days. Perilous times uh, shall come, the Bible says. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Many people are just looking out for themselves. You know, I want to get everything the government's got to give. I want to get everything I can get out of you. Lovers of their own selves. A covetous, boasters, Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. My, there's a lot of parents that's finding out their children aren't little angels now that they're having to homeschool uh, their, their children. Uh, it's a funny video that was on of some father calling up his child's teacher and saying, uh, you, you know, uh, you're going to start back to school, aren't you? You've got to start back to school. That problem we had last month, you know, just forget it. <laughs> Um, and uh, so uh, disobedient to parents. Uh, we, we could uh, uh, preach a sermon on that. Unthankful. People uh, are, are, don't have a spirit of gratitude. Uh, unholy. Without natural affection. We, we find that immorality is abounding and, and not uh, what God has said was supposed to be the, the, the style that God would have us to have. Truce breakers, false accusers, incident. Uh, that means troublemakers. There's a lot of people who just want to cause trouble. They don't ever do anything good, but boy, they can sure stir up a stink. Uh, troublemakers, incident, and not content with anything. Uh, fierce, despisers of those that are good. It just amazes me that so many governors have so much problems with churches now. I mean, they, they want to close down churches. Uh, we can leave the bars open. We can leave the abortion clinics open. You know, we, we can leave uh, the Home Depot open and the Walmarts open, but uh, churches has uh, got to be closed. We've got to have social distancing. Well, I think you can look around here and say, we've got plenty of social distancing uh, in our church. We're not violating any orders there. The, the traitors, heady, high-minded, that's a inflated with self-conceit. Oh, I'm, I'm the special person. I'm better than you. Uh, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. The false gods of this world has had to close down too. Not just the churches. Uh, I, would have ne- I would have said there would never be a time that 
the NBA would be closed down. Uh, there'd never be a time that baseball season would be, would be put off. Uh, that was just something that, that was unthinkable. So there's a lot of things that have closed that uh, I would have never dreamed that anything could have happened that would have caused that, that to have happen. Uh, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. We got plenty of religion, but not much godliness. We need to have more godliness and maybe less religion. Then number two, uh, in the world, we know emerging cults and national crisis is going to take place. Matthew 24, Jesus was talking about the end time, and he said there, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. My religions, new religions have come. New doctrines have come. All of a sudden, many of the old established uh, religions have decided that, uh, well, this is a changing time, so we've got to change our philosophy, especially in the area of morality. It, it is, it is a, a sad that people don't want to just go by the Bible, but rather they'd go by whatever the world's philosophy is at the time. Then he says, For nations shall rise against nations and kingdom against kingdoms. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes. We always thought those famines and pestilence and earthquakes, well, that must be in the foreign countries. That must be in the third world countries, you know, Africa and South America and some of those countries that, that don't have a, a whole lot. But we have it right here. Pestilence has hit us right here in America. And earthquakes. Earthquakes happening in places where they'd never happened before, in diverse places. And, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And so we see a, a departure. Israel uh, illustrated it over and over and over again in the Old Testament. And America was a Christian nation at one time. It's sad to say we're really not a Christian nation anymore. And uh, we, have, we have seen iniquity abound. And the love of many have waxed cold. Then the third thing that we'd have to say that is in the news that we know that God, God has a direct hand in everything, one way or another, but in particular is a tension in the Mideast. Palestine will continue to always be a focus point in the world right up until the battle of Armageddon. And so uh, we think things are bad now. We know there's coming a day that'll be much worse. When I was taking the tour of Israel, we went uh, to the up a, on a mountainside, looking out over that valley where the Battle of Armageddon is going to take place. It's amazing to me that they take us on a tour, and they, of course they could tell us about the battles that had already taken place in that valley, because many had. But I say this is where, in the future, the Battle of Armageddon is going to take place. Of course, it was. You know, for Christians, and they, uh, they like to impress us. It was a beautiful valley, a beautiful farming area. But one day the blood, the Bible says, will, will be flowing in that valley. But we're building up to it. The hatred for Israel is like no other hatred that we could find in this world. There's many people who would like to wipe them off the map. The Bible says in Zechariah 12 um, and 20, uh, 21 says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. That's speaking about that battle of Armageddon. But uh, those things are coming and we're building up to it. And we've talked about it. And then the fourth thing that we know that, that God has talked about and has promised is going to come, the growing preparation for a world leader. You know, things are happening now that 20 years ago I would not have been able to explain as far as the power of the Antichrist, the expanding world population, the ease of world travel, the reason we have this problem, this pandemic all over the world is because the airports was full of people and they were coming in from China where it started all over Europe. They were coming into the United States uh, when I was 
Last time, I, well, when I was in Bolivia, I was uh, amazed at the influence and, and the power that the communist China had, uh, the offices, the buildings, uh, uh, the flags of communist China flying in several places uh, there uh, in, in Bolivia. And, and so we, we have a world community now. Used to when something like this broke out, it could kind of be uh, cornered in one little area of the world. And, and keep it there. But now, with world travel, that's not the case. Uh, the perfecting of worldwide television. You know, we can see events taking place on the other side of the world with seemingly no, no delay. Maybe it's a little bit of delay and we're not, not aware of it. The, the perfecting of worldwide television, communication system, the phenomenal ability to store uh, information and then the, uh, to, to broadcast it. Uh, there's only, uh, these are a few of the awesome conditions uh, that has taken place in the world where a, a world leader could suddenly emerge and, uh, and have fl- influence in every country in the world. And, of course, we know he's going to be called the Antichrist. And one of these days, he's going to come on the scene. One of the most shocking things is that uh, the philosophy of uh, people are getting uh, little things implanted into them for all kinds of reasons now. I, I, I thought for a long time when you heard the mark of the beast, oh, people just wouldn't accept that. But now they're accepting implants for all kinds of reasons. Uh, you, you know, uh, your uh, credit cards can get stolen and, and your bank fraud, uh, can, people can get a hold of your bank account. Well, we'll just take care of that. You don't have to worry about credit cards anymore. Just insert this. The Bible says the mark of the beast, you'll not be able to buy or sell uh, without having a mark of the beast. And I thought one time, well, you know, if you got cash, everybody take cash. There coming a day where cash won't be any good. You'll just have, have to show your mark in your forehead or on your, on your arm. Some people believe it'll be a visible mark, 666. Other people believe it'd be something implanted in the skin. I kind of lean towards the implanting thing, but it may be both. It may be a little, uh, but, it, but at any rate, that day is coming and we're, we're building up to it. And of course, we know the rapture uh, is going to take place in that time and then the Lord's going to come back at the end of the seven-year period and rule and reign for a thousand years. But if we're living in the times building up to that, my, as Christians, we really need to be prepared for it. There, you know, Christians need to especially be dedicated for, for a time like that. And so as we uh, look here uh, in the Bible, I want to talk about some of the things that maybe we really need to do to be able uh, to, uh, to stand in, in tough times. And so the first thing that we need to do is use the Word of God to cleanse your mind of unscriptural ideas. I believe that the devil in the flesh knows our weaknesses and our, maybe our unspoken desires. And he wants to take full advantage to get us away from what God would want us to be and how God would want us to live. The Bible says in James 1.14, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Oh, we like to blame others for the problems that we have. You know, it was the devil made me do it. Or I, I got in the wrong crowd. Uh, that's, that's a favorite excuse for people. I got in with the wrong people. But the Bible says every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. I'm 69 and a half, soon be hitting that 70 mark. I wish I could say I got rid of all my lust. But there's still a lot of evil desires in the old flesh. And they, you have to be on guard against them. The Bible says in John fifteen three, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. It is the word of God that cleanses us of the vile filth of this world and even the vile filth of our mind. But if you're not in the word, it doesn't clean you. You know, hopefully everybody takes a bath every day, a shower, bath, something, to get the filth off of you. That's the physical outside that needs to be cleaned up. But the inside needs to be bathed probably more than even the outside. And the Bible says now you're clean through the Word. You've got to be in the Word of God. 
It's not just a matter of coming to church one time or three times a week or, or however many times a week. You personally need to be in the Word. This is where Christians are falling short in a, in a lot of their lives. They don't have that, that devotion time. In the Word of God, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, uh, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing in captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What a challenge that is. We, we need to control our thoughts. We can't control them by ourselves. Clean through the word and, and uh, casting down, uh, calling on the, uh, on, on the Lord to give us the power to do so. Number two, we need to cleanse your home of uh, books and magazines which are opposed to the Bible. And oftentimes uh, when we talk about that within the home, the person that's talking about it says, well, uh, maybe to the wife, maybe the wife to the husband, uh, maybe, maybe to the children. You, you need to get rid of those things that are, are uh, conflicting with the principles of the Word of God. Do you know, we need to start off with me, myself, and I. Whoever, whoever uh, has this conviction, first of all, they need to, uh, need to be uh, doing it. Uh, they need to be cleaning their home. Uh, anything that refers to uh, non... Uh, no, I'm not talking about every book that's written by a non-Christian, but those that which challenge or contradict the principles of the Bible, even if they claim to be Christians... There are some people that claim to be Christians and yet they write things contrary to the Word of God. And so there should be a, a search, any religious book written by a false teacher, especially books by cults and false religions need to be cleaned, uh, cleaned out of your home. Any book or magazine connected with the occult, including astrology and witchcraft. You know, it's funny how Satan can make those so attractive and, uh, and make you want to get involved and at least read about them. And once you read about them, maybe you want to get involved with it a little bit. Those are things that are, are diabolically uh, against the principles of the Word of God. We need to know something about the future. We need to be talking to the Lord about it. We need to, if we want to have guidance, we don't read our astrology column. We need to be reading the Word of God and let Him lead us as to what we should do. Any book or novel or magazine which is sensual and any book which majors on the humanistic philosophy of things like evolution and, uh, and, and takes away uh, from the truth of, of the Word of God. It's better to have a few books that honor the Word of God than a library full of books which challenge the authority uh, of the Bible. And so um, you can expect people become attracted to many times the wrong things. And if you, you may say, well, I got this thing. You know, it's not that bad, uh, but I'll, I'll just leave it there. It's amazing how a spouse or children could become attracted to, uh, to the wrong things. All right, then number three, and this, this one, uh, it might be kind of radical, but you need to think about this. Sever your relationships with any close friends who reject the Bible. Now, we can't take ourselves out of the world we're not all going to go live in a monastery. And we're all going to have some friends that, uh, that maybe aren't, aren't Christians and aren't living for the Lord at all. But we need to be careful about who we are intimate with, who we're really close to, who we let influence us. We need to find friends that's going to influence us for good. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 33, be not deceived, evil communication, corrupt good manners. And so the word communication means company. Evil company corrupts, and the manners means morals. Evil company corrupts good morals. There's many a person that's been, that's been hurt or corrupted uh, by somebody else because they, they want to just associate with them. They, they seem like a, a personality that drew them uh, to them. Uh, but we need to be careful if they're going to be drawing us away from what should be our closest friend, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in, uh, 
2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22, the Bible says, Flee also youthful lusts, which follow righteous, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. We think of youthful lusts. First of all, we think of immorality. Many times when, when as a person gets in their teens, they become uh, attracted uh, to things that, uh, and, and, and uh, it, it is good to be attracted to other people. But we know the Bible teaches us that before we are, are in, involved in uh, sexual relations, we should be married. And, and in this world today, uh, the philosophy of the world today is, well, you don't have to wait till you get married. You know, you, you can try some things. But that the youthful loss begins to take through. But I got to thinking about that. I think a lot of times in the, as a teenager, you become infatuated with popularity, wanting to do, wanting to please people, wanting to uh, get the accolades from people. And if it means that you can't take a Christian stand in order to make people happy with you, then you, you compromise your Christian stand in order to get along uh, with people. Flee, flee that as well. Peer pressure. A lot of times we attribute that to teenagers, and they do. Uh, I, I know many teenagers that would say, well, I don't want to do that because what will people think about me? And my friends may not like it. And, and, and uh, on and on. And, and they w won't do good things many times because they don't want their friends to be unhappy with them. And uh, they do bad things many times because they want to I impress their friends. But, but the, the scripture talks about, though, uh, we need to be careful about who we want to associate with if they're going to lead us away from a godly standard and from what God would have us to do. Now, in 1 Timothy, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 11, uh, we find here that the scripture says some things that as a church we should separate from. Uh, Paul was dealing with a man that was living in immorality in the church in Corinth and, and they were kind of snickering about it and laughing about it. He said, no, you need to break fellowship with that person if they're going to live that kind of lifestyle. And then he listed some things uh, that we should not be in fellowship with as far as the church is concerned. It says, but now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man uh, that is a, called a brother, another Christian, be a fornicator or immoral or covetous, that's greedy, you know, just looking out for themselves and many times to the harm of other people, or an idolater, worshiping a false god in a false religion, or a railer, it's abusive, a slanderer, or a drunkard, someone that's overcome by the influences of alcohol, but we could probably say drug addict and several other things uh, nowadays, or an extortioner, it's a swindler or a robber, a Christian taking advantage of other people or somebody that claims to be a Christian. You know, I learned a long time ago when I'm trying to do business for the church and somebody comes up and says, well, I'm a Christian, you ought to let me do it. And if we're going to be paying them, I think, well, maybe I better keep an eye on this guy. You know, I've had some Christians take advantage of me or people that claim to be Christian. With such, no, not to eat. Now, this doesn't mean when you go in a restaurant, you've got to stand up and say, all right, is anybody in here a fornicator or a covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner? I'm not supposed to eat with you, so I'll have to leave if you are. No, he's talking about in the church, the observing of the Lord's Supper. We're not to, we're not to have those people in the church and observe the Lord's Supper with them because they are bringing an evil name against the name of Christ. They're not glorifying Christ. Uh, out in the world, uh, we, we can't uh, be that selective. In fact, we're supposed to be witnessing to those folks out in the world. You know, I got to thinking about, I've been reading about Jehoshaphat. There's several chapters that, towards the end of, uh, uh, of First Chronicles, I believe it is, or maybe Second Chronicles now. But anyway, the, the story about Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was one of the great good kings in Israel. Now, he, he had really one flaw. One thing made him dumb. You know, sin will make you dumb. 
And so he had one sin that made... He, he wanted to associate with Ahab. You know, sometimes when you're a king, you just want to associate with another king. And, uh, you know, sometimes as a preacher, I get with other preachers and just want to fellowship with them. And, and uh, whatever position you are in, you probably get with other people in that position. Uh, but we, we see Jehoshaphat was the king over Judah and a godly king. He had brought about revival. Uh, he had put away... Uh, the false idols. Uh, he had uh, run off a bunch of people that was dishonoring God. He had been a good king there in Judah. But Ahab was one of the most wicked kings that there were in Israel, the northern kingdom. And so we find that uh, Jehoshaphat got with Ahab. And of course, Ahab talked him into going to battle at Ramoth Gilead. And, uh, and Jehoshaphat almost got killed. And Ahab did get killed. But when, when he got back, uh, the prophets ridiculed, not ridiculed, to chastised uh, Jehoshaphat for joining up with an ungodly king. Ahab was as ungodly as you could be. He was a terrible idol worshiper. He married to Jezebel, one of the most wicked uh, women that we find listed in the Bible. Uh, and so uh, he was, was chastised. He repented to God. And he... Uh, began doing good things again that God could bless and that God was pleased with. And so it come a time that, that Jehoshaphat died. Now in Je this weakness that Je Jehoshaphat had, uh, wanting to really have intimate closeness with an evil person, he in the, in the midst of that, his uh, son Jehoram was married to Ahab's daughter another young Jezebel. You know, the sad thing about the Old Testament kings is that they would follow God, they would get rid of the idol worship, but the philosophy of the world was if you wanted to have peace, you have to let your sons and your daughter marry the kings all around you. And so if they marry uh, into the family of the idolatrous and and ungodly kings all around you, then that king would not dare come and attack you because you're family. And so that was an ungodly philosophy. The philosophy that they should have had for their children is, I want them to marry godly spouses. I want my daughter to marry a godly man. I want my son to marry a godly lady. That, that should be the philosophy that they should have had. But... Instead of, uh, of really uh, doing what God had taught them to do, the teachings of that day and age was, this is the way you have peace. Now, over and over we find that if they had trusted God, they could have won the battle. But because they didn't trust God, many times they lost the battle. Well, Jehoam was married to the daughter of Ahab. And here, the oldest son after godly Jehoshaphat died, took Israel, took Judah away from godly standards. Went back to the things, all the things that Jehoshaphat had destroyed, all the idol worship of Baal and everything else. He went back gung-ho into doing that thing. The other thing that, that happened because of, uh, of uh, not having the right relationships as far as the world is concerned, Jehoam uh, all, the, all the boys, all the sons of Jehoshaphat had been given a particular city to kind of be the mayor of or the ruler of. And, uh, and, but Je Jehoam was made king and they were given a city. Well, when Jehoam got fully empowered, he killed off all of his brothers. You know, maybe they'd want to take his throne, so he just killed off all of his brothers. That evil philosophy of that day, of course, was kill off all your rivals so that nobody can challenge you for your kingship. I'm glad we got a little bit better system nowadays, but it's almost a personal assassination that they try to do with everybody that's against them. But you see, this, this one thing that Jehoshaphat did that wasn't that good, associating with Ahab, brought future destruction to his family and also uh, to his nations. And so we need to be careful what kind of intimate relationships that we have. Number four, cleanse your job of any work that violates Scripture, uh, the Bible says treasures of weakness and 
Proverbs 10, 2. Treasures of weakness profiteth nothing. Uh, and so oftentimes people uh, get rich and then it brings destruction upon their life. Uh, money wrongly gained cares with it a curse. Proverbs 17, 13. The Bible says, Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from their house. And, and um, the, the scriptures uh, tells us that uh, great treasures without right uh, is, is going to bring destruction. But better, uh, Proverbs 16 and verse 8, better is a little with righteousness than great revenue with, uh, with, without right. And so we, we need to think about the job that we have. Is it something that, can, that we can have and it, it's honoring to God? Or is it something that would be dishonoring to God? We all need to work. The Bible says if we don't work, we shouldn't eat. And one thing we know, we Baptists like to eat. And so uh, we, we all need to work. I, I don't want everybody to go out and quit their job because it, something's not perfect on the job. In fact, no matter what job you have, nothing is perfect. Uh, you know, even if you, if you work here at the church, everybody here is not perfect. You know, just me, but not. <laughs> no, I'm not perfect either. You find out uh, that. But, uh, but if we're doing something that violates God's standards, it may be that, that maybe we need to try to find another job. Maybe we need to try to do something that can be glorifying. So are you making money on a product that damages the lives or morals or health of those who use it? Are you required to be dishonest or deceptive in any way uh, or to compromise your convictions? Has God ever convicted you about changing your job? Maybe God's calling you to preach or to get into ministry or something like that. Are, are, are the demands of your work forcing you to sacrifice the time you need to be spending with your family? And so there, there are things that we need to evaluate as far as a job is concerned. Number five, cleanse your life of unnecessary distractions by reading, studying, memorizing, and meditating uh, on the Bible. We have so many distractions now that to keep us so occupied that we don't have time to pray. We don't have time to read our Bible. We need to have the right priorities. And those priorities need to be solid in our life. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to have some family time. Uh, and so uh, you, you may evaluate uh, those things. Maybe there's, there's some things, uh, some uh, hobbies or things that, that needs to be removed so that you can do the things that God has said that you should do. Then number six, replace what you remove. Don't just leave an empty spot there, but replace what you remove with godly influences in your life and in your home. Find ways, of course, to have that family devotion. Find ways to have that prayer time. But find ways to uh, have that uh, time doing, doing other things as well. Purchase, purchase classic Christian books and biographies and, and read them. Get a daily devotional uh, book. Uh, invite godly Christians into your home to be an example to your family. Buy good Christian music and put scriptural plaques on the wall. Don't be ashamed of Christ. These are things that oftentimes in this world, the world would, would, uh, would shun and, and uh, would uh, criticize us for. But if we want to be a light, we got to get the dirt off the light, so to speak. If we want to shine brightly, we got to be dedicated to the Lord. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we live in a, in a wicked world. We live in a world that's wanting to turn everybody away from you. God, we, we've seen godly influence wane in this country. We see a country that is, uh, is doing evil things when it comes to abortion and when it comes to immorality and even tore down the, the standard for marriage. But God, I pray that you'll help us to stand, not let the world influence us, but may we influence the world. We ask this in thy name, amen. Let's stand with sing a verse of invitation. God's burden your heart. Step out on this first verse as we sing. Search 
Yeah. Mm-hmm.